Hello and welcome to One on One. I am Cyril Stober. My guest today is a priest, an academic and administrator, a professor of English who has distinguished himself in academics and is also recognized in the traditional institution. Let's welcome Professor Christian Anieke, Vice-Chancellor of Godfrey Okoye University, Inugu. Welcome. Thank you. Well, Professor Anieke was ordained a <coughs> Catholic priest in July of 2000, but a quick look into his past shows us that he had his higher education at the University of Nigeria and Suka, Urban University, Rome, and the University of Innsbruck in Austria. He was provost of the Institute of Ecumenical Education, Inugu, from 2006 to 2009, professor of English at ESUD, that's the Inugu State University of Technology, in 2007, and professor of English, Godfrey Okoye University, Inugu, where he has been the vice chancellor since 2009. He is the author of numerous publications and is a recipient of many awards and titles among them, Honorary Citizen of Mitakishan in Austria, Correct. Ambassador of Peace in Nigeria, and uh, Ezeudo Buruburu of Umumba Ndiago in Ezeago Local Government of Inugu State. He has been in the forefront of many <coughs> community projects and is the Grand Patron of Police Community Relations Committee, Ezeago Division, Grand Patron Nigeria Scout Movement from 2016 to date. Professor Anieke, welcome once again to One and One. Thanks very much indeed for inviting me. Right. Ezeudo <laughs> Buruburu of uh, Umumba, that's a traditional title. And uh, it's curious for some of us, uh, as a Catholic priest, uh, you hold a traditional title. Is there a conflict here? No, there cannot be a conflict between uh, the church and tradition. Hmm. The Catholic Church actually promotes tradition, culture, the church has uh, three approaches to any human culture. Uh, take what is essentially good, mm. purify what can be purified, and reject what is essentially bad in a culture. Mm. And the church emphasizes intercultural uh, relationship. You know, in other words, you take elements of one culture and bring it into the Christian culture. So I don't see any conflict between uh, traditional culture and uh, well, well, I ask this question because for so many, the perception about the traditional institution is that it is steeped in so many uh, practices, um, some of them not open to uh, uh, greater uh, outer society, and um, some of them sometimes are thought to bother a little bit on uh, uh, practices of those you might call the heathen and things like that. So it's assumed that um, once you are a priest, uh, you put aside all those things, but you say you can uh, no, take so much. It's, uh, it's certainly <laughs> not. You know, uh, when God created the world, God yes. saw that all he created was good before mm -hmm. he rested on the seventh day, right. according to the biblical narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's impossible that all elements in a culture are bad. Mm -hmm. It's a wrong understanding of culture. Mm -hmm. uh, the church understands this too right. and uh, tries to, you know, look into every culture, take what is essentially good, purify what can be purified, and reject what is essentially bad. All right. You see, when Paul came to uh, Athens, he looked at the place, all the temples, and saw a temple dedicated to an unknown God, and mm. said, I have come to preach to you about this unknown God. You have a temple for him, but you don't know him, and that's the God I have brought to you. So you have to look at what is available, see what they do, mm. see what can be taken, see what can be rejected, and see what you can reconcile with the Christian faith. Right. So the understanding of culture from the point of view of being essentially evil is not Catholic. All right, but yeah. you were ordained yeah. a Catholic priest in uh, 2000. And uh, yes. why the priesthood? Why? Was it something that um, as a young boy appealed to you? Yes, yes. Uh, I remember as a young boy, I was asking why are people marrying? <laughs> Right. You know, I was asking that question as a very young boy. I didn't understand the concept of marriage. So mm. I think that was the time God put it into my head. And I said as a young boy, I would, I would never marry, you know. Okay. Uh, but uh, somewhere along the line, I forgot it. It was no longer an issue for me. I went to a normal secondary school, was a normal boy like every other person in the, the school. And then 
uh, in the course of my life, shortly before I entered university, you know, I started having a very strong inclination again to religion, to the faith, to prayer. And uh, from day one of my stay, of my uh, arrival at UNN, the urge to be a priest became very, very strong. I couldn't reconcile my admission with being a priest. So I was confused in my 100 level. I went to an elderly priest who was also a professor at the university mm. and they sp uh, explained to him what I was going through. I looked at me and said, well, God does not make any mistake. If God allows you to be here, then there is a reason for it. Face your studies and you will see what God has for you. That was very, very, that was very, very motivating. Okay. So I worked assiduously and uh, finished my uh, studies with a good, rec a good result. I went to him, he looked at my results, shook my hand and said, okay, took me to the bishop. I didn't know he was taking me to the bishop anyway. So he took me to a house, said I should wait in the car. I waited and after about 10 minutes, he, he came out of the house with a man wearing red buttons. No, that was the first time I had seen the bishop of Enugu Bishop Energy then. So he pointed to me and said to the bishop, that is young man, he will be a priest. The rest is history. <laughs> so, and so here we are today, you're a priest, you're also an academic. But I'd like us to start on a broader note and look at the state of Nigeria today. You have been a recipient of so many titles, among them Ambassador of Peace. If you look at Nigeria today, it leaves a lot to be desired in terms of peaceful coexistence. And of course the place of religion. There are some people who say, we've got so much religion in this country and a very little godliness. What do you think about Nigeria today? Uh, it's actually what inspired our university, Godfrey University. I looked at the landscape, the religious landscape of the country, the cultural setting, and uh, also the epistemic landscape. And I thought to myself, uh, we have to design something that will be able to solve our problems. A university must exist to solve problems of society. That's why we came up with our philosophy of dialogue. Dialogue of religions, dialogue of cultures, and dialogue of fears of knowledge. That is central to what we are doing at the university. We have so many religions here, and sometimes we begin to fight one another. That cannot be. We are talking to one being, not two. We are worshipping one God, not two. So how come then that we can't understand one another? So I thought to myself that who could begin from the university? It's all, almost late. I mean, normally you begin from, yeah, from childhood, okay? Right. Mm -hmm. But that if you can do something at the level of the university, I think that's okay. So culture, uh, dialogue of religion means that students have to recognize that they have one God. They have to leave this out in their prayer life they must learn to pray together. And that's actually what we are doing. They recognize their different religions. In the morning, they go to their different religious groups and do their worshiping. But in the afternoon, they have to recognize that we are worshiping one God and pray together. And also, they have to learn to respect the views of others. Mm -hmm. We have what we call Unity Week, once a year, where students are allowed to express themselves, where they are allowed to say, I mean, what they feel about others, where they, 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 they learn to listen to others, and respect their views. So these are the things we are doing. Of course, we have some studies uh, like peace, co peace and conflict studies and all that, but we try to leave out this element of a religious dialogue. Also, cultural dialogue. You know, more often than not, these things are connected. Uh, sometimes you confuse it too. You think that somebody from this particular culture belongs to this particular religion. So cultural dialogue is also very, very important to us at the university. We try to help students to understand that uh, they have an identity. And each of them has his or her own identity, which must be respected by others. So when we have our unity week, for example, each cultural group in the university will prepare different things. Their dances, their food, their language, everything they want to show the other students. And the others, for example, are invited to dance with them, learn their dancing style, learn one or two of their languages or dialects, learn to cook with them, learn to also share their food. Okay? It's quite interesting to watch the Vice Chancellor going around to test the food of every cultural group. Hmm. Sometimes I've, I would think, oh, after this, I'm, I'm going to have running stomach. You know? <laughs> but you know, it's just quite an interesting thing. And with that, you see that students are actually trying to understand one another and they're trying to 
you know, respect the cultural views of others. Then also we have the epistemic dialogue, which is dialogue of all the religions. One thing I feared uh, when I was in Europe was this expression you have in German, Fachtrotto. Mm. A Fachtrotto is someone who knows just one thing and nothing else. You know, I said to myself, that cannot be education, that you are just an expert in this, but any other thing is irrelevant to you. There must be a way of helping you to learn a bit of different things. Why being an expert in one thing? And that's actually also what we're trying to do with epistemic dialogue. So we saw the challenges and designed our curriculum to meet the challenges we have. I think that's what it means to have a university. Today, the conflicts are there. And um, would you say it is a leadership question? Or is it part of the followership? Because people who are in positions of authority and have influence over the followers, from their actions and their words, a lot can happen. Yes. Uh, let's look at the personality called Nigerian. It's very important. Whether you're a leader or a follower. And that is what we must address. The Nigerian. You know, Finland as a country passed through a lot of stages of difficulty from Sweden to Russia and all that. Mm. A long period of colonization. And look at Finland today taking first or second positions in PISA text, test examination. You can, it, I mean, it, Finland made up its mind as a country to change the personality of things through education. So it's no longer a question of who is the politician or who is the follower, it's a question of the personality of things. And that's, I think, that's what we must address. I don't like this, so the problem is leadership, our problem is followership and all that. We have a problem with the Nigerian personality. Mm. And we must address this problem at the level of education, from the family to nursery school to primary school and all that. And if we have the type of Nigerian we want, then we will have the type of leaders we want. And we will have the type of followers we have. Otherwise, we'll be wasting our time. But that's a tough call, isn't it? Because um, the Nigerian personality develops uh, right from childhood into the adult. And uh, is influenced by what happens both at home and uh, at the educational institutions. There are two things we face today. Let's say the home has shucked its responsibility to the younger generation. Education has not done much. Uh, institutions have broken down as well. And so a Nigerian child grows and is left to adopt whatever it wants to adopt. So if we rely on changing the perception of the Nigerian child, at what point do we begin to get it? Because that child is also influenced by his parents, who yes. may have been influenced by other factors of society. Uh, every beginning is difficult. Germans say it, Allah Anfang ist schwer. Every beginning is difficult. We simply have to decide what we want to do as a mm. nation and begin it today. And we can't expect that we're going to get the result today. We can sow something like a farmer. You plant and you hope that at the end of the year, you will have your harvest. Mm. The problem we have in this country is that we don't have patience. Okay? We don't have, we think that things will happen overnight. You, a, farmer, a farmer will go to the farm and begin to get yam without planting yam. It doesn't happen anywhere in the world. You can decide that in the next 20 years, this country will be different. And we start working assiduously to make it possible. Different plans and all that. Of course, politics will play its role, but it's all our collective desire. Once, and that's actually where NTA will come in. Mm -hmm. How do we get Nigerians to have a collective desire and move in, the, in line with this particular desire? It's very important. Uh, it will not happen today. It will not happen tomorrow. But we can start laying the foundation today. Just like you want to build a house. You don't expect that the house will, I mean, will be finished in one day. It depends on the kind of house you want to build. If it is a one-story house, a two-story house, a three-story house, you lay a solid foundation. And also, you look at the terrain of where you're building. You do the structural analysis of the place and all that. Know the kind of building you need there, and they start working. It can take you 10 years, but you have the building you want to have. So 
I still come back to the foundation. I'm not looking at the present moment. We know the problems. The challenges are enormous. You know, <laughs> wherever you look at, if you mm. look at a family. I mean, many children don't have parents. We're not even talking about those who have, I mean, who many don't have parents. Their parents are gone. They don't have anybody taking care of them. There are more, at least more, than one, uh, more than 10 million Nigerians who don't have parents. Okay? So, <laughs> before we talk about those who have parents and their, I mean, whose parents are not doing the work they should be doing, there are many who don't have parents and are rooming the streets. And they're going to talk to them about uh, obedience. They're going to talk, about, talk to them about uh, avoiding crimes and all that. Who, I mean, who is teaching them? They don't know anything. They don't understand their language. They don't share, share their linguistic word. When you hear that somebody takes 200 naira to kill another person, you just shake your head. You, know, you, you don't share the same word. So we simply have to do the foundation. And that is not the work of politics alone. It is the work of Nigerians who decided to change their society in the next 20, 30 years. Are we doing enough to start this process that you say? Because uh, let's take the place of um, religion, for instance, in national development. Nigeria is awash with churches, mosques, all kinds of institutions. Yet, we see emanating from these religions sometimes hate messages which uh, again exacerbate this, the, the problems that we have. Yeah, uh, let's go back to the school. You know, uh, the school, the school system is a molding process. Mm. You come into this world and there is a process that makes you the kind of person you are. Mm -hmm. I like the definition of education as a gradual process that makes human beings out of animals. I like that. Basically, we are animals. Having all the tendencies, all the these things, take a, a child away from the human society and put a child into the bush, the child develops elements of uh, animals, lupine tendencies, we call it. So it is the, this process of molding that makes us what we are. So let's look at that process of molding. Mm. Before we talk about the pastor, let's look at the process of molding. Because the pastor is going to come out of this system. The politician is going to come out of this system. The NTA person is going to come out of this system. The priest, everybody is... So let's look at that process. What Finland did as a country is to make this process a uniform thing. If you are from Finland, you pass through this mode and you become the kind of person they want you to be. I don't have to start from nursery school. Finland, the qualification of a teacher in Finland is master's degree. Mm. Master's degree. Okay, it's so attractive. It's so attractive. The, 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 the respect you have as a teacher is equivalent to the respect a medical doctor has, a lawyer has. So if we address the, this molding process, then we will get it right. We'll get it right. It's not somebody in north having a, dis a different system from somebody in the south or now it's, it's one country is it we, we simply have to make up a mind to do this project called nigeria you yeah. know and, and we can get it right in within 20 30 years we can get it right if we that's want. if you begin now yes we'll begin now we can get it right it's a collective desire let us ask ourselves the question do we want to exist or do we want to disappear from this world it's easy to disappear many empires have come and gone and that's not what we want. We want to exist. And if we want to exist, we have to do the foundation of this building, beginning from the molding process, education. Nursery school, uniform standard everywhere, wherever you are, whether in the north and the south, primary school, uniform standard everywhere, wherever you are. Before we talk about university, this is actually the way. And we can do it. Mm. I'm convinced we can do it. All right, because you, you, you come from the academia. And, uh, You've all, all, since we started this discussion, you've been emphasizing the position of education. And that's another worry for this country, the state of education in Nigeria. Now, you say how important it is to mold the Nigerian. And you have an education system right now that leaves a lot to be desired. What is the way forward? Yes. Uh, this, uh, we say, when you look at our universities, with all the professors we have, with enormous investment in resources, and then you look at the products, you cannot but begin to question a lot of things. 
our professors are good. Take them out of Nigeria, put them in other universities, and you see their performance. So why are they okay? not turning out so students the, with uh, the, the that high quality? The, the, the context. Which university will run a 24-hour experiment without interruption, for example? That's the context. Without NEPA striking and interrupting the process. Which a university will have e-learning uh, procedure without the server being destroyed by constant interruption of, of supply? And all that. Which university will have students moving around without their employing a lot of security personnel and all that to make sure that nothing goes wrong, for example? And how many students can feed themselves? Many students are hungry. They can't. You give them the best of stuff and everything is forgotten because they have not eaten. These are challenges. The contest is quite challenging. So you can be an excellent professor, but you, you come into a context that is full of challenges and you see. But take this, this particular professor out of this content and place him somewhere else. When I teach in Munster, when I teach in other universities in Europe, I see the difference. It's not that they're more brilliant, but the context. They have electricity supply. They, can, I mean, they have means of coming to, to university. They can be late to classes. They, they don't come to class hungry and all that. So you see the difference. They're not more brilliant than your students. You know that. But you see the challenges your students have to be able to catch up with what you're saying. All right. The challenges are there. But it is expected that um, the universities, for instance, would play a big role in turning things around. And uh, it's been said that of all our academics, our professors, they prefer to just put up their feet and attach their strings of qualifications after their names, and uh, they don't engage in much research. They point to other parts of the world where academics have spent a whole lifetime researching and inventing things, and we're not seeing that here. Yet, our academics go to those climbs and they excel. Is it that something prevents them from applying the knowledge to doing things that would lift their own country up? Yes. Uh, it's very good that you've said this. How much is available for research in this country? We want to look at poverty levels in Abuja, for example. You will need a lot of resources to be able to do this. You need a lot of people to you know, do one or two things in different places, unless you're using just one person to measure poverty level. Hmm. So where is the money for this? In other places, you have companies you know, showing interest in research, for example, paying for research. The funny thing is in this country is that we are waiting for government for everything, which is not the case in most countries of the world. Research is financed by companies interested in using the product of research to do their business. That appears not to be the case here. I don't expect government. Government, government does, doesn't have endless resources. Certainly not. Some individuals are richer than government. I read last time, 50, about, about, I mean, 50% uh, uh, of the resources in the world are being controlled by just about 10 persons, you know, 10 millionaires in the world have 50% of all we have. That means individuals are actually richer than the so-called government. And that's actually a problem. When these individuals who have all the resources are not investing the resources they have in education, they're waiting for government to do this. It's unfair and it doesn't actually. So how do we get people to finance, finance research? And how do we also help the teachers, the professors, to be able to do their work without hitches? I gave an example with electricity supply mm. and all that, with water supply, with all the security challenges and all that. The atmosphere is very antagonistic to research. That's why. This. But that's not a reason for, to fold our arms mm. and say, yeah, the situation is difficult. There's nothing we can do about it. No. Problems are there for us to see how we can actually move around within the limitedness of what we can do, the limitedness of our resources. We must continue to, you know, Find ways. The, the challenges are enormous, but we must continue to find ways of doing research in spite, in spite of the challenges. But let nobody think that it's quite easy for us, for us scholars in Nigeria. Let nobody think that it's not easy at all. You, you, for you to do one thing, let us take, for example, water in this country. For you to get water, 
24 hours. What do you do? You pay a water bill. That may not be enough. You dig a borehole. That may not be enough. You, you get a water tanker to supply water and all that. How many things are you doing to achieve one thing? Electricity. OK. You pay a NEPA bill. That may not be enough. You need generators to run. What about diesel? The generators will get damaged and all that. Look at so many things you are doing just to solve one problem. On top of that, you simply have to put money to do your research. It's quite challenging. It's quite challenging. Nigeria has a huge population, anywhere between 150 to 170, and some are even uh, going as far as saying maybe close to 200 million. And we have so many ethnic groups, different. In some states, you have as many as 10, or sometimes up to 13 different languages. Is that a drawback to development? Because when you cite examples, I say, look, we are different because we are so huge. Is population and an ethnic background a drawback? Ethnic, ba uh, dra uh, ethnic background cannot be a, draw mm -hmm. a drawback to growth. You know, uh, because we, each ethnic group represents wisdom, represents new ways of looking at things, represents language, a new language, new ideas and all that. So if we have many ethnic groups, that will actually make, should actually make us rich. You have enormous places, I mean, uh, you have places where you can tap your ideas from. You have variety. When we say variety is the spice of life. It's very good that we have so many ethnic groups. But then, in the issue of population, I think, <laughs> I think we are becoming too many. Hmm. I must say this. Uh, because uh, uh, we look at the resources we have, we look at also the geophysical space we have, OK? Uh, I think 997,000 uh, square meters, what we are sharing in this country. And uh, compare that vis-a-vis -vis the space we have, in terms of food supply, infrastructure, and all that. There must be some control. We may not go the way of China, one child, one, one man, one child, hmm. you know, one family, one child. We may not go that way, but there must be some form of, and this again will come from education. There is this feeling, especially in my own part of the world, the South, God will take care of the children. I can get as many as I want to have is not my responsibility. Somehow, God will be able to have the children. I don't know how it works. In the civilized world, you have to check your budget hmm. and see whether your budget will take one or two children. You're not waiting for your uncle to go and pay the fees of your children. You're not going, waiting for God to come and pay the fees of your children. You have to know, I have 100 naira, and 100 naira should be enough for a child or two. That's a normal thing. So this thinking that somewhere uh, somehow somebody's going to pay is not actually uh, very responsible. And that's what education can actually solve. But letting you see, it's your responsibility. You have a child, you should be able to take care of it. So the population is a problem. It's a problem. All right, so if the population is a problem, that presupposes that um, there'll be challenges in acquiring or accessing uh, appropriate economy to take care of uh, there's huge numbers. Now there's a huge struggle here. Like we mentioned, there are many conflicts. And some see it as basically economic. Uh, the struggle to control resources, especially in the face of dwindling resources, and uh, with not much coming in, the struggle for economic power is dovetailing into what might be termed ethnic chauvinism, and, of course, religious uh, issues. As a peace ambassador, how do we address this? Uh, it's very important to know that there are conditions for coexistence. Mm -hmm. uh, in spite of the challenges we have, in spite of our number, in spite of our historical circumstances, we simply have to take a fundamental decision about living together, mm. about living together. We have to take that decision today. 
Is it, uh, my role as peace ambassador is to, you know, try to have some programs to help young people, especially, realize that uh, they can live together in spite of their challenges. If you have 20 persons and you have just one piece of bread to share, how do you do it? You know you are 20. You are not going to reduce the 20 to 1. Mm -hmm. just, the fact is that you are 20 and you have just one, one, one uh, loaf of bread to share. So how do you do that? That each person has a piece of this bread and is satisfied and all that and goes without one person taking it and the others go hungry and then they'll be fighting and killing and all that. So uh, my role is simply to have some, some programs for young people. We have what we call peace initiative, you know, uh, peace uh, conference every year. We bring in young people to the university from different schools and uh, we we'll try to talk about peace. We we'll give stories of peace. We we'll talk about sharing the resources we have. We we'll talk about tolerance, about love, about care for others and all that. The implication of not caring, the implication of being selfish, what it leads to and all that. Young people get to understand it. We have what puzzles to help them to see now this action leads to this and all that and that leads to annihilation of the whole setup. So that is it. My role is simply to say, yeah, look, I'm not going to solve all the problems we have here. I know the challenges, but then my take there is, in spite of the challenges, we can live together. We can still live together. We may not have the best of resources, the best of standard, but we can manage what we have and live together. The 1st of October 1960 was when Nigeria gained its independence from those who colonized the country. And um, 1st of October is also your birthday, uh, looking at your, <laughs> your resume. Uh, five years after, precisely on the 1st of October, after independence, you were born into this country and you've been everywhere. You think that we deserve to be better than where we are today. We can do a lot better because we have the resources to do better. Because we have the passion, we have the energy to do better. If we, it's a, I keep looking at our young people when they go out for competitions, especially football. I look at them, the eaglets or the falconets. I look at them. It, they are Nigerians. They are Nigerians. And look at what they achieve. Or look at the Paralympics, so for example the so-called handicapped, disabled, look at their achievements. Oh, I look at Nigerians outside the country, Nigerians in the diaspora. It's, it's amazing what they can do. We can do a lot better. We can do a lot if we want to. Uh, we had one Dr. Malai at the University of Innsbruck. Dr. Malai could tell whether you were a Nigerian or not. Mm -hmm. She looked at you and would tell you you are a Nigerian. Why? Because in her class, in her German class, Nigerians would take first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, tenth position. So smart in learning the German language. So that you know, inspired her interest. She could tell you, this person is a Nigerian. Just open, open your mouth and Malai would tell you, you are, you are Nigerian. You can't hide. So we can do a lot better. I know this. We can do a lot better. And that is actually what inspires my passion for this country. I love Nigeria. I love this country. Maybe it has got to do with my history, with my birth. Why was I born on the 1st of October? So already as a child, I was called one Nigeria as a child, one Nigeria. <laughs> okay, so you can understand why I'm passionate about Nigeria. Mm. Okay? <laughs> so we can do, we can do it. We can do it. We have the capacity, we have the personality, we have the zeal, we have the resources. It's just putting the fact, all the factors together. You know, creating a molding system that will make us different. Right. It's been said that you may have all the resources, but um, in every society, you do have one or two people who possess the qualities of galvanizing, harnessing these resources. Heroes, sometimes they call them. Do we like heroes in Nigeria? Because whether we like it or not, somebody has to drive a process. Do we have the kind of leadership that we deserve? In other words, people ask, what is the state of a leadership recruitment and who do we throw up as leaders of society? Are they well-rounded? Uh, 
we don't lack heroes in this country. Otherwise, our anthem would be useless, you know. We salute our heroes past. Yeah, the past heroes of the nation. Right. We have where, a lot of them. Where are the present are, heroes? Well, <laughs> there are still many Nigerians. I mean, when you read, they may be simple people. A hero is not necessarily somebody who is the president or somebody who is the vice president. Of. A hero is that person who actually represents what the country wants. When you hear the, a woman returns about a million or two million at the airport or something like that, that's a Nigerian hero. Okay? When you hear that your own person goes and represents the country so well in a, spo in a sporting event, that's a Nigerian hero. When you hear that a Nigerian child takes, takes his position at Harvard, uh, for example, that's a hero. Let us not have a limited view of what it means to be a hero. Mm. We have a lot of role models, heroes of this nation. What we would like, would like is probably celebration of our heroes. We don't celebrate them so well that others can see them as role models. Hmm. Our hero, heroes are often forgotten, and that is the place of the media. That's where the media houses will come in, NTA, Radio Nigeria, all the media houses, in the celebration of the heroes. So the young people will have role models, enough, in so many role models, they will say, okay, that's my hero, and all that. Um, but, we, but we do celebrate individuals of high net worth, and somewhere along the line, the perception is skewed into thinking that um, the more resources the individual has, um, the more assured a place he has in society. And at what point did we begin to look up to huge resources as our, uh, our models? That's it. That's it. I, at what point? You know, in the, uh, I remember I grew up in a village. And as a young man, I knew that elders when I was a child, we are different from what elders will have now. An elderly person will tell you, this is it. This is the way I see it. Don't give me anything. Don't give me any food. If you, I mean, just hit me, but this is the way I see it. Truth was respected. Okay? But go to a village today, give a bottle of beer, and the story changes about something. Hmm. That wasn't the case. So I don't know what happened to the personality of Nigerians. They, they, I no, I don't know at what point actually. But I know that a lot has changed. Because I saw it when Ada spoke the truth. This is the point, And you knew as a young boy that that was the point. Mm -hmm. And he was not ready to take anything from you to change the opinion about what he felt was the right thing. But today, that's no longer the case. They desire to have money. And all that sometimes looking for mo having more than you need. That's another area that we don't know how much we need. We keep amassing wealth, keep building houses, and at the end of the day, children are going to fight over the houses. At the end of the day, the houses or all the things you've left behind will become a source of division in your family. Know that. So at what point did it change? I don't know. But I know that a lot has changed about the way we actually uh, do things. This country. If we might just go a little bit uh, philosophical now, I, I always wonder when they talk about peer pressure, and uh, it would seem that um, a little evil always overcomes a large good, contrary to what we believe that good will always prevail. If you find one person in a group who does what is wrong? Why is it so easy for other members of that same group to be pressured into adopting what is bad rather than the other way around? So you do hear that uh, influence, uh, you know, peer pressure, influences, and, and, I, and I ask myself, why is it that good doesn't quickly influence bad the way that bad does so easily? Yeah, that's the question. <laughs> that's the question. You know, what is bad is easier to get. It's easier to get. It's easier to break this glass than to do one. It's easier to bring down this house than to build this house the way it is. And all that. It's easier. That's a shortcut. Hmm. That's a shortcut. It's easier. It's more comfortable. I mean, you don't need to stress. If you tell somebody to build a house, they give him something to destroy a house, he does it in a twinkle. That's why. And that goes again back to the personality of Nigerians. Why do we tend to, you know, why do we choose the easier way? In the past, we heard that people did difficult things. 
Gandhi, for example, the Indian leader, he, he walked without shoes. He fasted for his country. Yeah. He slept on hard wood and stones and all that for his country. He could have chosen the easier thing to do. And all. Well, he chose the hard. So why are we choosing the easier one? There's a tendency, of course, to choose something that's easier. But then we have seen in the course, course of history, human beings choosing harder things because of what they will achieve eventually. Mm -hmm. And again, that also shows the value attached to things. The value we attach to things. I was reading about Finland yesterday. I come back to my Finland, <laughs> reading about the country. The country ha is one of the best in, in this uh, program for uh, testing students, uh, international student assessment, PISA. But then the country doesn't celebrate it. It's not celebrated. The country will rather spend time celebrating golf and all that than celebrating this achievement. In, you know. And then a Finn a teacher who uh, solves a problem because one of the greatest things you can do is to help a child to learn, especially a difficult child. You see somebody who will dedicate his life to helping a particular child to learn and to solve some problems. But when this is achieved, you don't get the teacher saying, yes, yes, you know, I did it, you know, announcing it. So that's also another personality. So it boils down to the personality of Nigerians. Let's go back to education. And, uh, you say it plays a big role in defining who the Nigerian is. There are those who think that our education system does not really prepare people to be the kind of citizens we desire. Um, yes, Nigeria was colonized and um, a system of education inherited from the West tended to prepare people for the positions that the colonialists wanted so as to be of benefit to their countries. And there are people who say it hasn't changed to a large extent till date. And that's why we're churning out the graduates who are either unemployable or who cannot function properly and uh, uh, be the leaders that we expect from these institutions. What is the problem with our system? Yes, you rightly said, you know, the, historically we, ha we have a system uh, that goes back to Britain, and uh, Britain produced uh, clerks, those who could serve the system, mm -hmm. administrators and clerks. And we are still there. Not much has changed. Even when you don't need clerks, even though you don't have uh, space for administrators and all that, nothing has changed. Uh, it is high time we changed this pattern. You know, education must serve the needs of society. It must serve the needs of society. And that's where the designers of a curriculum I mean, should actually be paying attention to. What kind of curriculum do we have? In the past, history, for example, was removed from our curriculum. But just imagine that. Imagine not organizing your ideas in a very historical uh, perspective. You know, having chaotic ideas, unconnected ideas. We removed the history. In spite of our difficulties as a nation, history is the number one thing we should have needed. So that you learn what happened to you in the past and you don't make the same mistake. And we removed it from it. my curriculum. And then we look at the, the, all the management courses we have, all the social sciences we have and all that. And you ask yourself, number of those in the management of social sciences vis-a-vis -vis, uh, number of those in natural and applied sciences and what we need, what is it? What we try to do in our university, for example, is to show students the professional sides of their courses, of their studies. I always ask each student, what are you studying best? What are you going to do with it? It's very important. OK, I'm, doing my, I'm studying mass communication. So where do you want to work when you finish? Do you know anybody in that field? Do you have a role model there? So from day one of your studies, you begin to get in, pay attention to your, the professional side of you. So if you, are, if, if you are, uh, for example, you want to do IT or you want to spend your time with this, you get to know that so that you know you have a target. There's a target in your studies, not just studying for the sake of studying. Studying, I mean, graduate, and I mean, nothing. Then there's issue of employability. The issue of employability. There, many have said different things about this. Many graduates are not employable. Not employable, not because they're not smart. But you, can't, you don't need them. They have not studied the things you need. 
For example, you want to repair an aircraft, for example. You fly somebody yeah, from outside the country. You want to repair a simple thing. And you have somebody who has studied that. In the, the Nyafia, for example, the media house, I don't know how many graduates you can actually employ. Those who have the things you need, invite 1,000 of them today to, <laughs> to an interview, and you'll be shocked. Many cannot write a simple sentence without a mistake. They can speak well. That's one thing, again, I observe among Nigerians now. They speak well. They speak better than they write. Okay? Probably because of the influence of nursery school and primary school, communication in English and all that, speech is good. But writing is bad. And all the technical ideas that you expect that somebody in mass communication should have, do they actually have these things? Can they fix these different things, the cameras you have here, and position these cameras in such a way that you can have an interview the way you're doing now? Are they prepared for it? Are you going to spend your resources training somebody who has gone to university? So these are things. So we have not actually succeeded in designing curriculum that we meet uh, this thing. What, uh, again, I, I have seen in Finland is this, that teachers have uh, been given enough space to design their own curriculum. The state has what they call minimum standard, mm. what we expected to have, but as a teacher, you can design something on top of that to meet the challenges of your school. It's very important. So I think that is something that has to come here. If a school, for example, is, is situated in a farm place, why is farming, this farming, farm situation, why is the farm situation not the primary thing done in this particular school? Why are you doing things not connected with farm life in a place that is predominantly a farming area? Why can't you design curriculum that will improve the farming setting you find yourself in and all that? So I think a lot has to be done. And it has to start from each school and each institution. I like the prayer of one woman, God change the world, begin with me. <laughs> it begin with me. So each person, not should, should, should. A lot of should has been said in this country, but let each institution begin, begin to do something. Experiment with new ways of meeting challenges you have in your context. Okay, so we, as, we, as we round off, uh, Godfrey Okoye University uh, does operate um, uh, a broadcast uh, uh, station. And you've been director of that. I'd like us to look at the role of community radio just quickly and see what is, what can the media, the mass media, bring to the table in terms of developing this country? Very good. We have going to radio 106.9 FM. What we have achieved with this radio is to give students room, especially students in mass communication room, to have hands-on experience in their field. They come to the studio, they learn. We have two studios, one for practice, where they do the preliminary preparation, and then the main studio that transmits. So you get prepared, and you, are, you come to the radio, and give news, and write commentaries, and produce programs, and all that. That's one thing. But again, we have, the uh, we have used our community radio, our campus radio, to teach. We have some lessons going on on the radio. For example, a program, Get It Right, a use of English program, Get It Right. So wherever you are, you are on campus and in and its environment, you listen to this use of English program. You improve your language. The teacher teaches you and all that, and you listen, and uh, so you ask your questions. Then you have also psychology, uh, some courses in psychology being taught also on the radio. and. Uh, uh, you have uh, also for the school. What the most important one is the radio school project that we have actually done with this community radio in collaboration with Radio Nigeria. All right. Okay. Um, just about run out of time, but I, I must quickly chip this in. Uh, the traditional media, as we know it, is facing a big challenge today uh, from what is now known as the social media. Do you worry about? The I power do. of the social media and what it can do and undo. Yes, I worry a lot. The social media actually uh, will represent what we call post truth. This is the post truth. Uh, where truth is no longer the decisive thing, or facts are no longer the deci decisive thing, but the way you feel about it. A kind of populism. That's actually what this uh, 
social media will represent. Mm. Populism. Uh, the normal, traditional media are being challenged by this. Because which one is true now? Which one is true? Is that the one they hear, they circulate in the night, or the one you are giving? You say, this is, this is where it is, and somebody gives and oh, no, this is not the thing. This, you have said, it is white, you have done investigation, you have, the, your reporter has brought in, this, this thing is white, and in the night you hear it is black. And that is the one many will be taking. So that's actually a very, very dangerous thing. I do not know how the conventional media will, will be able to tame social media. <laughs> it's like a Frankenstein uh, animal that we actually established there. We have, uh, we have you know, created an animal that is bigger than, than what we thought. You know? <laughs> and, so, uh, some people have suggested some form of regulation, but uh, that's difficult, is isn't it? Because you, I mean, uh, the, the web is largely unregulated. It's so difficult. I mean, which, what are you going to regulate? Unless you close down the internet. There are different ways. There are different uh, channels of, of getting information and circulating information. It's, it's, it's terrible. And it's not, a, I mean, of course, you see the whole world is under the influence of social media. Look at what's happened in the United States of America. The influence of social media in the elections. And it's, that's what is happening everywhere. It's a terrible situation. I ask myself sometimes, is the world coming to an end? <laughs> How come that within a very short time we are talking about post-truth? How come that this has become the, 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 the trend in our world? So it's, it's, it's a headache you are going to continue to have in the next couple of years. So and I don't know how we can solve the problem. Yeah, for the traditional practitioners, yeah. uh, the ones in the traditional media, yeah. what would you say to them in, uh, <laughs> as they face these challenges? Well, I can only say hold on to what you are doing. The truth will eventually triumph. That's the only thing I can say. Professor Christian Anieke, it's been interesting talking to you. Um, uh, we do hope that we will sometime ask you to come again uh, so we can have this kind of dialogue with you. Thanks like very much thank indeed. you very much for coming. Glad, on yeah, on thank you for inviting me. Right. God you. bless you. I've been talking to Professor Christian Anieke, Vice Chancellor Godfrey Okoye University, Enugu, has been our guest on One on One. That's our program for now. Next week, we'll reach you again on One on One. I am Cyril Stober. Bye for now.